Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to come back. This is one of my favorite topics. I like it because I, I did a lot of genetics back in the day when I was in school, so it's nice for that to be useful because I certainly haven't used it in medical since I've been in medicine. Uh, so I have finally updated my slides here to the modern, uh, the modern church website. So if you want to find the article on this, you go there. Uh, the Gospel Library is right there. And then that'll take you to this page. And there's a few ways to get to it. This is probably the easiest. You hit the topics down there. You'll get this thing. And then you can hit the gospel topics. And then you get this big long list. Uh, there's a bunch here. And let's scroll down. And then, <coughs> excuse me, if you uh, scroll down a little bit here, you'll find Book of Mormon and DNA studies. So it's not under DNA. It's under Book of Mormon and DNA. <coughs> So this is an interesting topic for those of us who, who think about and write about uh, criticisms of the church because it's relatively new. Uh, this is obviously something that Joseph Smith's era would not have thought about. Most anti-Mormon attacks are, are old. They have been around for decades, if not centuries. Most of the main ones were set out in the very first anti-Mormon book published in 1834, just four years after the church was organized. Uh, and by the Uh, responding to these sorts of things is basically a case of saying that's been asked and answered and, and saying yet again the answer that, uh, or the answers that have been out there for a long time. But this one is new. It really only kind of showed up uh, around the turn of the millennium. But even it isn't entirely new. Uh, it's really just a new approach on an older thing that I saw in the late uh, 1980s and uh, was uh, confused by for about half a second until you think about it, um, which we'll do together tonight. Uh, it was based on blood types. So sort of the same thing. I mean, blood types are coded for by DNA. DNA is just kind of a more detailed way to look at the same sort of thing. So the idea or the criticism was, uh, if you look at this, this shows what percent of populations in various areas have blood type O. And uh, you'll notice that Central and South America there, uh, 90 to 100 percent of the natives of that area uh, are blood type O. And then if you look over to the Middle East there, you'll see that it's 50, 60, maybe 70 percent. And so the claim is, well, if you took people from the Middle East, should match. Uh, there's the same kind of idea. You can see that Native Americans are almost all O and a little bit of A, whereas uh, others are not. And same kind of thing here. This is the blood type distribution of today's Middle East. You know, so it doesn't look like the, uh, the Americas at all. Uh, and so uh, the same argument to answer that is the one that answers this one. Uh, and so we'll go through it a bit in some detail. And it's useful to do because it is a question. People, unfortunately, have left the church over this, though uh, uh, that's really unfortunate because it shows they or the people they're listening to don't understand basic genetics. Uh, but it's also useful because it shows us how to think about problems that trouble us. It's, it's a good example of how to approach something that worries you. So we're going to take it kind of, this is how I would go about it anyway, if I was thinking about this for the first time. So the basic argument is this, and this is useful to do. It's useful sometimes if you're struggling with something like this to put it down on paper and to say, okay, what, what is exactly being claimed? Do that in as much detail as you can. So we're going to do that here. There's basically three points to the argument. Point number one, the Book of Mormon claims to tell us about a group of people who came to settle the new world from Jerusalem at around 600 BC. Point number two, it is possible now for us to examine the DNA of living and to some extent dead American Indians. You can dig up, you know, uh, preserved bones and stuff and you can sample the DNA in the bone. And the third point is, when you do that, the DNA you find is of Oriental origin, not from the Middle East. Therefore, Book of Mormon faults. So when you're faced with a scientific claim, especially like this, you should break it down and decide what parts are true, which are false, and which you don't know. So let's do that with this. So first question, 
Does the Book of Mormon claim to tell about a group of people coming to settle the New World from Jerusalem around 600 BC? Yes, it does. Can we examine the DNA of living and dead American Indians? Well, yes, we can. And three, uh, is that when we do that, is that DNA shown to be of Oriental origin? Well, yeah, it is. Oh, dear. So, do we have a problem? Well, many people will stop there. Sometimes, though, uh, we build assumptions into our argument. Critics might do it intentionally, or we might do it unconsciously. So I want to go through it point by point. We're going to look at what assumptions are built into these statements, which... Yeah. There we go, we're back in. Ah, okay. So we're going to go point by point. Well, it depends what you mean. So here's the first one, and it's the longest. So Book of Mormon tells us of a migration in 600 BC of people from the Middle East. So this point has some things that are assumed that we may miss. The Book of Mormon does tell us about a group that came to settle the New World. And then we also assume from that, okay, that means those transplants are the ancestors of the American Indians. And then this is where we make the mistake. These transplants are the only ancestors of the American Indians. This one's true, this one's true. This one, as we will see, is almost certainly false. So what does the Book of Mormon say about it? Here is Lehi's party. These are the people that uh, came over with Lehi. You can see how many of them are each there. You got Laman and Lemuel with a wife, Thephi, Sam, Jacob, Joseph, who are children and didn't have wives that we know of, Zoram, the Ish Mr. and Mrs. Ishmael, the sons of Ishmael, and Lehi's sisters. We don't really know about them. That totals up to 16. We know that's pretty much for sure. And here, four or more. Uh, the wives of the sons of Ishmael's may actually have been Lehi's daughters. Uh, and so the 20 would be, the total would be 20 uh, if there were two sons. And it would be strange for Lehi to get wives for his sons and none for his daughters. But let's, we'll be very conservative so people can't claim we've kind of cooked the thing. Let's assume there were five sisters. Five so at the outside, I think you have a group of 34 people. It was probably less than that, but we'll, we'll say 34 to, to be safe. So that means we have 34 people's DNA, right? Well, well not so fast. Lehi and Sariah had children, Laman, Lemuel, Nephi, Sam, Jacob, Joseph, and the sisters. Uh, Lehi and Sariah are two people, and those children will all share their DNA. If, if you don't understand that, then you need a birds and the bees talk, and I'd be happy to give that to you later. Then you've got Mr. and Mrs. Ishmael, who are the sons of Ishmael and Lehi's, the Lehi's male's wives. Again, only two people. Uh, so again, there's only two people's DNA there. And then we have Zoram, the cheese stands alone. He's, you know, he marries into the Ishmael family, but uh, he's not part of the family, so he brings his own DNA to the story. So he has one. So really, we only have about five people's DNA. Maybe that's a little higher if those other, if the other wives, if the sons of Ishmael's wives aren't there, but call it 10, 10 people at most. So now I want you to think about this. All right, well, if that's true, if we have about 34 people with five to 10 different gene donors, how well does a population do for 440 years, which is about 22 generations, if you have only five gene donors? The answer to that is they do poorly, unfortunately. Um, a good way to look at this is the Amish who live in the eastern United States. They're the ones who don't use electricity, stuff like that. They live kind of like the 19th century. Um, so they have a small population, and the missionary program for the Amish uh, is not a robust one. There aren't tons of people flocking to join the Amish. Uh, only 75 people have become Amish, Amish since 1950. And almost all of them are descended from only 200 people who came up to the United States in the 1700s. And as a result, because they marry among themselves and they have very little what's called gene flow into the population, uh, they are at higher rates of metabolic illnesses and some other congenital diseases. 
The reason for this is that when they get defective genes, as long as you have one gene that works, you're fine. But as soon as you start crossbreeding, bad gene, then you have a 25% chance of having a child with a sickness. One of the groups, the Lancaster group, comes out of only a few dozen people, so about the size of, of this group that we're thinking about Lehigh having. Uh, here's what happens. They have something called Ellis van Kruveld syndrome or chondroectodermal dysplasia. There will be a test on the end on that. It's due to two gene effects in the old order Amish and the Aborigines in Australia have it too. Normally in the general population, it's one in 60,000. The old older Amish, it's five in 1,000. So it's over 300,000 times more common. And up to 13% of the Amish may carry one of the genes for it. 50% uh, of those babies die before they're born because of heart defects. And Can tell that kid on the bottom isn't doing well. He's got a bunch of people around him and a uh, feeding tube down his throat and, you know, not doing well. And they get polydactyly. These kids have multiple, uh, you know, that one kid there has six toes on both sides. You can see the kind of deformed toes there. Here you see some hand abnormalities uh, from this condition. So, uh, so that size of a population is really just not viable, not for 200 years like with the Amish really, and certainly not for 2,600 like uh, the Book of Mormon. So does that mean we found another contradiction? Has, have we finally discovered that Joseph's clever fraud is revealed and we should all you know, go home and get a 10% raise and get Sundays off? Well, let's read on and see. So what happens in the Book of Mormon? So they arrive, Lehi and company, and then the colony separates in 2 Nephi. Nephi splits from Laman. Some of the people who came go with Nephi and others stay with Laman. So who goes where? So here's all the people. So Lehi and Sariah are dead. Laman and Lemuel and their wives and presumably their children go with Laman. Sam, Nephi, That's everybody. Here's the scripture. It came to pass that I, Nephi, to take my family and Zoram and his family and Sam, my elder brother, and his family and Jacob and Joseph, my younger brethren, and also my sisters and all they who would go with me. And all those who would go with me were those who believed in the warnings and the revelations of God. Wherefore, they did hearken unto my words. Okay, so there they all are. But who's this? All they who would go with me. The only people unaccounted for in that list are Laman, Lemuel, and uh, the sons of Ishmael. So there's somebody else that's going with Nephi, and it sounds like quite a number of people going with Nephi. Something else to think about. The Lamanites are always said throughout the entire Book of Mormon, they're always said to outnumber the Nephites. So where do they get the bodies? I mean, Le Nephi just took most of the colony with him right there if they're the only ones on the scene. Alma says about apostates later on, their souls are precious and many of them are our brethren. So the Lamanites, the Nephites, and the Mulekites, who they meet later, you remember with King Benjamin and King Mosiah, they're always called the brethren by the Nephites. So why are only many of them their brethren? Who are the other ones? Mormon also talks about another people who are in the land of Bountiful near the narrow neck that Moroni worries will ally with them against the Nephites. Again, we're not really told who those people are, but they're clearly not Nephites. Also, we know from archeology, span the entire American hemisphere was peopled well before 600 BC, probably by 14,000 BC or 12,000, they had reached Tierra del Fuego, the very southern tip of South America. So there were certainly people there when Nephi and Lehi got there. Also, some of the Nephite crops, including corn, which is uh, the first cor crop always mentioned by the Book of Mormon, uh, it doesn't grow wild. It, you can't just show up and have corn growing. You have to have human help to grow it. And so because of that, Lehi's group would have had to have learned how to take care of the plant, and there had to have been somebody who was already taking care of it to teach it to them. And finally, Nephi says that within 40 years of them arriving, they'd had wars and contentions. 
So let's assume, which is pretty generous, that every family had six children that lived to adulthood. That would be extraordinary. Uh, then Lehi, Nephi's initial group, without anybody else, would be 24 people. And let's give them a growth rate that's double the highest growth rate ever seen in the developing world. And let's assume that no one dies prematurely, which is uh, quite an assumption in the pre-modern world. So then at the 40-year mark, there'll be 330 Nephites. But let's be fair, a more reasonable number would be about half of that, since people do tend to die early in these societies, especially children. The mortality rate of children is probably at least 50% by age 11 are, are dead. So that's 165 people, realistically. And that is still higher than any growth rate that's ever been observed for a, a non-modern country. Layman's group would have to be smaller than that because fewer of them stayed with him. So how do you have a war with 165 people? Even if you say every male fights, that's only 82 men, boys, and infant boys. That's every male, every male there versus a smaller army of the Lamanites. And everybody that you kill in that battle is not going to be around to add to the numbers or to have children or anything like that. And so it just makes the numbers worse and worse. And plus they're all inbred, you know, and probably suffering from genetic illnesses if you do that. So to summarize, it's impossible for Lehi and company to have found an empty hemisphere. Uh, we know that, that archaeologically. There were millions of people in the Americas when Lehi arrived. And the Book of Mormon mentions some of those people and implies their presence at other spots, if you know where to look. And the early saints, including Joseph Smith, never seemed to notice that. They weren't terribly close readers of the Book of Mormon then. And so that's curious because you have this, this stuff that's really quite obvious when someone points it out to you, but Joseph and company didn't recognize it. So once again, you have Joseph Smith producing this complex, involved book uh, that all hangs together, and yet Joseph in some ways doesn't seem to have understood it or read it, but the clues are all there. So John Sorensen, one of the first people to do this kind of work, said this, Hereafter, readers will not be justified in saying that the record fails to mention others, that is, other people besides the Nephites and Lamanites, but only that we readers have hitherto failed to observe what is said and implied about such people in the Book of Mormon. So you remember, they are not the only ancestors of the American Indian. Just said, uh, if you say, okay, there was millions of people here and Lehi's group would have been mixed into them. Well, we just talked about how there were five, maybe 10 different, type, different examples of DNA at most. What happens when you put those five or 10 people or DNA samples into a population of, of millions and millions of people? Well, take an Olympic swimming pool, add one drop of red coloring to the swimming pool. Let it sit for 440 years, then mix it with a bunch of other swimming pools when they meet Mulekites and others. Then when Columbus shows up, get rid of 94% of the swimming pool because that's how many percent of people died from diseases when Columbus came to America. And then find me the red drop. Good luck. One of the early former members of the church who raised this issue said this about all this. Mormon scientists have argued that the bottleneck effect, which we'll talk about in a minute, genetic drift, which we'll talk about, Hardy-Weinberg violations, and other technical problems would prevent us from detecting Israelite genes in Amerindians. That's what I'm saying. And he says, I agree entirely. In 600 BC, there were probably several million American Indians living in the Americas, and if a small group of Israelites entered such a massive native population, it would be very, very hard to detect their genes 200, 2,000, or 20,000 years later. Not sure why he says 20,000, because they should get harder and harder to detect, but anyway. But he agrees. He goes on. But does such a scenario fit with what the Book of Mormon plainly states or what the prophets have taught for 70, 75 years? No, no. Well, as we've just seen, it does fit what the Book of Mormon taught. 
But what he's essentially admitting here is this debate is not really about the science at all. Everybody agrees what the science says or shows. It's about theology. It's about how do you properly read the Book of Mormon? What does the Book of Mormon act actually say? And he's quite right that some people, uh, probably including Joseph Smith, thought that all the American Indians came from Lehi. But it's also very clear that others did not think that and that it was not a required view or an obvious view. And, and this was something that showed up on the scene far, you know, decades before anybody, uh, before DNA was a gleam in Watson and Crick's eye, you know. And this was, if you go all the way back to the 1930s, um, uh, this is 1997. Church official spokesman said, whether there were the first inhabitants, we don't have a position on that. Our scripture does not try to account for any other people who lived in the New World before, during, or after the days of the Jaredites and Nephites, and we don't have any official doctrine about who the descendants of the Nephites and the Jaredites. Remember, the First Presidency said, we must be careful in the conclusions that we reach. The Book of Mormon does not tell us there was no one here before them, and it does not tell us that people did not come after. And again, that's what, 30 years, just about before DNA was even identified. So this is not just some excuse that people have cooked up lately to try to save the Book of Mormon. It's been said for decades and decades and decades. And if you go back to 1947, Hugh Nibley, one of the prominent Mormon scholars of the era, he said, once we admit that all pre-Columbian remains do not have to belong to Book of Mormon people, the problem for the Book of Mormon archeologist, or we would say geneticist, when such appears will be to find in America things that might have some bearing on the Book of Mormon, not to prove that anything and everything that turns up, including DNA, is certain evidence for that book. But wait, doesn't the Doctrine and Covenants call the Indians near Joseph Smith Lamanites? Well, yes it does, but you gotta remember that's 2,000 years roughly later. If Lehi had any descendants uh, from 600 BC that were still living in Joseph Smith's era, then every person living in the Americas was a descendant of Lehi. Now that's something I seem like a strange thing to say. Uh, especially when I tell you that just because they're descendants of him doesn't mean that they will have a genetic marker from him. But that's how human descent works. Here is an article uh, from, this is a non-LDS population geneticist. And at the time this was written, the book, uh, the, uh, the Da Vinci Code had just come out and it was a very popular book. And in the Da Vinci Code, one of the parts of the book is that there is a, a group of people who are descended from Jesus, that Jesus had children and that these people still existed and that they were going to take over the world or, or whatever. And so his question that he was trying to answer was, can this happen? And he says, well, yes, but if anyone living today is descended from Jesus, so are most of us on the planet. So just like I said, if there is anybody living in the Americas who was descended from Lehi, then they all were. Because Lehi is 600 years before Jesus. So if that's true of Jesus, it's definitely true of the Americas with Lehi. He says, now that sounds funny. That, that seems wrong to us initially. But that absurd sounding statement, he says, is an inevitable consequence of the strange and marvelous workings of human ancestry. Say you go back 120 generations to about 1000 BC. According to the results presented in our paper, your ancestors then included everyone in the world who has descendants living today. If Jesus had children, which is a big if, of course, and if those children had children so that Jesus' lineages survived, then Jesus is today the ancestor of almost everyone living on earth. True, Jesus lived two rather than three millennia ago, but a person's descendants spread quickly from a well-connected part of the world like the Middle East. So again, it's probably true of Lehi. I'm probably got some Lehi descent, if the truth be known. Uh, but certainly everybody in the Americas would have been. In addition to Jesus, he goes on, we're all also descended from Julius Caesar, from Nefertiti, and from Confucius. Uh, the person we know that has the most descendants, or the most identified, is Genghis Khan, incidentally. He has millions of descendants that you can actually trace his lineage through. But we're all probably descended from him, mostly. Anyway. And from any other historical figure who left behind lines of descendants and lived earlier than a few thousand years ago. Genetic tests can't prove this, partly because current tests look at just a small fraction of our DNA. That's starting to change. 
But if we're descended from someone, we have at least a chance, even if it's a very small chance, of having their DNA in our cells. So notice what that tells you. Just because you're descended from someone doesn't mean you have their DNA. Other people are not, but human ancestry just doesn't work that way, since we all share the same ancestors just a few millenniums ago. So back to our basic argument that we started with. The first argument. Book of Mormon claims to tell about a group of people coming to settle the new world. Well, that's not quite true if you pack all those other assumptions into it, that they were the only ones, etc., and that we'll be able to detect them. Uh, that's not true. So if that's not true, then the argument fails. We could stop there, but let's just go on and see how the rest works. We could rewrite this and say, the Book of Mormon is about a very small group of people coming to settle the new world, which already had millions of people in it from Jerusalem. That's correct, but that's quite a different claim with quite a different implication for the Book of Mormon's truth or falsity. Next, point number two, we can examine the DNA of living and dead Amerindians. Uh, and so this, at this point, people are saying, well, can you really lose a genetic signal like that? Yes, yes, you really can. Here's a study in Iceland. Iceland works well for this sort of thing because it doesn't have a lot of people, and there are very few people that move into and out of Iceland. It's relatively isolated. It's out in the middle of the Atlantic. You know, nobody else speaks Icelandic. And so they did a study where they traced the lineage of all about 130,000 people that are currently living in Ireland, in Iceland, the whole country, everybody. This compares people uh, who after 1972. So on the left is the modern, uh, let's see if I can draw in here. That can let me? No, okay. So you'll just have to use your eyes. On the left, that's today's uh, genetic mix. On the right is people from 1842 to 1892. So the blue boxes are descendants. So the small little light blue box on the right gave descendants all the big blue boxes. The people with the dark blue box there with the X there, they have no living descendants. So what you find with human ancestry is that either genetic markers become really common, like this 26% of people suddenly was found in 86% of people, or they vanish quite quickly. And that's what happened to the top. And then you've got the orange bit at the top. Those are people who, who weren't tied into this group. Presumably they're immigrants or some, some other source. So this group gave all that group. If you go back even further to say the set, to 1698, you know, another century or so, look how many people no longer have descendants, 89%. Only 10% of the population gives you all that. So can you lose genetic markers? Yes, indeed you can, you totally can. And then there's this group up here again uh, that they can't uh, tie into the group they've got. So it turns out gene markers do disappear even over relatively short time spans, just a couple of years. All that was over 300 years. Now do that for 2,600 years and add millions of other people to dilute it out, which they didn't do in Iceland. They were using the entire country. So we can measure American Indian DNA, but we can't know if we have identified all the markers that existed there in 600 BC. We almost are guaranteed that we cannot. Here's an interesting example. This is by Hugo Perigo. Uh, Hugo is a, uh, a member of the church from Italy. He has a PhD in genetics and studies early uh, Native American uh, population and gene spread. So he probably knows more about this than anyone on the planet, literally, or at least as much as most people know. He gave uh, an interesting example from the church's essay that I'll just read to you here. He, he, I've heard him use this example for himself. He says, my genealogy confirms that he's a multi-generation Italian. He knows who his parents, grandparents, etc. are. He lives in Italy, for crying out loud. Uh, I've been to his house. It's lovely. He's got uh, olive, branch, olive trees all around. And, yeah. So he's Italian, believe it. He looks Italian. But the DNA that he did of his paternal genetic line is a branch of the Asian Native American haplotype C. 
So this means that somewhere along the line, there was a migratory event from Asia to Europe that led to the introduction of DNA that's not typical of his place of origin. So he has a great, great, great grandmother somewhere who had a child with somebody who was not Italian and was from quite far away. Now, imagine that Perigo and his family are Lehigh and company, and you put them in the Americas, and they have lots of kids, and then later you go back to measure his descendants, and you trace their chromosomes, and you say, oh, group C. Well, that's not the Middle East, that's not Italy, that's Asian. So you've just proved that Perigo is from Asia. Well, no, you haven't. It's just that's how these markers work. He's an exception to the rule, and so what you see from him doesn't match what you would expect. And so what this shows is that people who use this argument really don't understand the genetics. They don't understand the science uh, and aren't listening to those who do. Because like I said, if anybody understands, it's Hugo. There are more problems with this. What does Lehi's DNA look like? You know, we're using the Middle East as if that tells us something. But there's a few things you need to remember. Lehi left before the Babylonian captivity. If you remember when the Babylonians came in, they took a whole bunch of people and they drug them off to Babylon. You know, that's where the Jews ended up. There were huge population shifts that have happened since then. So what on earth makes us think that the DNA of the Middle East today would match Lehi or even most of the people in Lehi's era? That's just naive. Plus, Lehi isn't Jewish. He's from Manasseh. Manasseh is one of the lost 10 tribes. Have you got a whole group of Manassehites kicking around somewhere that I can test their DNA and figure out what their markers look like? No, we don't. So using Jewish DNA isn't even a, necessarily a good marker for Lehi. And individuals aren't clones. We saw that from Hugo Perigo. I mean, we know Hugo's from Italy. Most Italians would have typical Italian DNA, but for whatever reason, Hugo doesn't. So if you happen to pick a Yugo, you're gonna screw up this entire approach to solving the problem. This is called a genetic bottleneck. Bottleneck, here we have a whole bunch of beads in a bottle, uh, but you can only get a few out of the bottle at a time. And so just by chance, the bottle that you get out, or the, sorry, the bead you get out is one of these yellow ones. There's very few yellow ones in the population there. You know, those could be Yugo's type of people. Uh, but just by luck, we pulled Yugo out of, the, out of the mix that's in Italy, and that's what we got. And then if you send Yugo over to somewhere and have him and his family reproduce, you're left with only yellow ones. The yellow ones don't look anything like where they started from. That's a genetic bottleneck. That's what happens with this. So unless you can tell me precisely what Lehi's DNA looked like, I have no way of knowing if the yellow matches him or not. We only have five people, remember. And they're living, they're Manassehites that are still living in Jerusalem, even though the 10 tribes have been carried away. So they're already a little bit unusual. You know, they're a little bit of outsiders, even as it, as it stands. Here's something else, this is called genetic drift. Genetic drift happens as you have less survival just by random chance of various markers. You look at the first one, they start out equal. Just by chance, more blue ones survived into the next generation. What that means though is that there's gonna be a pressure so that more and more blue end up in there just by chance. And before you know it, you're left with only blue and no red markers. That could very easily happen with Lehi and company. Uh, in fact, we know it happens. Uh, of of uh, what's now Israel and uh, Lebanon. They immigrated probably from Europe. They were called the Sea Peoples, and they invaded the Middle East and settled colonies along the coast where they would later cause problems for the Israelites. So we know a lot of those people came. It was enough people to drive out the inhabitants to, to be a military risk and to set up colonies and cities. Despite that, that was 1200 BC. If you look at genetic material from bodies that are uh, four or 500 years later, none of those have the markers. They all look like the native uh, Middle Eastern people. They don't look like the European markers. So small groups tend to get swamped out. We know that happens. 
So we can examine it, but we're A, we're looking for a really small signal. You're looking for that drop of red blood in a swimming pool. Found it. We could be staring right at it. Maybe Lehigh had O-type blood, and that's why the whole continent is type O. We don't know. And even if we did know, uh, we don't have a modern sample for Lehigh to know when we've got a match. And if it once existed, it could be gone now, even if it was there. Remember, 94% of the population of Indians, Amer Indians, that were in the North and South America before Columbus came died off from disease. That's, gonna, that's a bottleneck event in spades. And uh, the, 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 another problem is that there were people who came from Asia and Europe and the Middle East to the New World after Columbus. So if you find a marker in a modern day 21st century Native American, how do you know that that marker came from Lehi's time and didn't come later? There's no way to tell. There's no way to tease them out. So that means you need to find DNA markers in dead bone, more than 500 years old, and that is not easy. In that uh, Philistine study that I told you about, they found over 100 samples. They could only get DNA out of about 10% of them. So the sampling is really spotty. And finally, no studies have been done to test the idea anyway. You can't take studies that were designed to, to look at one thing and just madly extrapolate them onto the other. There's never been a study designed to test this theory, and I'm not even sure you could design such a study. I'm not sure what it would look like. We don't even know what we're looking for. There's an LDS geneticist. This is a gentleman who works for the national standards uh, in the United States. He has literally written the book on DNA testing for criminals. His name's uh, J.M. Butler. You see some of his books here. He's got many editions of them, Forensic DNA. And this is what he said. He said, it's important to keep in mind that reference samples are needed, to, always needed, to provide relevant results. So if you can't tell me what Lehi's DNA looked like, this, the game is over before we've started. In forensic science, he says a documented chain of custody is crucial to verifying a link between the DNA profile produced in the lab with the original crime scene evidence. No such chain of custody exists with DNA or genealogical records connecting people from Book of Mormon times to people living today. Oh, I do just close that and then back up again. Are we back? There we go. Okay, so back to our basic argument. So this one isn't really true, or it's not true without some qualification. We can examine the DNA of living and dead Amerindians, but we don't know what to look for, or how to recognize it if we did have it. So that's kind of a, mm, that doesn't really help the argument. Sure, you can do it, but it doesn't tell you what you need to know. Last one, this was quick. Amerindian DNA is of Asian origin. This is a study from Nature in 2013. They actually found that there's a label, uh, a genetic marker called MA1, that's found in modern day Western Eurasians, that's Europe and the Middle East. And it's genetically closely related to modern day Native Americans with no close affinity to East Asians. And we estimate that 14 to 38 percent of Native American ancestry can come from DNA gene, sorry, gene flow from this ancient population. This is likely to have occurred after the divergence of Native American ancestors from East Asian ancestors, but before the diversification of Native American populations in the New World. So this is long before Lehi. But even here, there is European and Middle East markers. So again, tell me, how do you tease these markers out from another marker from Lehi's day? If Lehi happened to have this marker, you're not going to find him. He's going to blend into the background. So this one isn't even particularly true. It includes the Middle East and some from Europe, but all that predates Lehi. So the story is much, much more complicated than the critics would have you believe. So in conclusion, so as it turned out, 
my initial hypothesis, the initial criticism was wrong or incomplete on every point. Every one of those things that at the beginning I said, oh, that looks like it's true. When I dug down a little bit, it turned out not to be true at all or true in ways that didn't help. So the Book of Mormon does not claim to exclusively talk about people from Jerusalem. Examining the DNA of living and dead American Indians can be done, but it isn't helpful at this stage. And that DNA isn't all of Oriental origin anyway. So here's the current state of the evidence. So what are the broader lessons you can learn from that? So it learns when you encounter something like this, A, you need to slow down, you need to take a deep breath. It tells you that you have to make explicit what you're thinking about and what you're claiming. It tells you that you shouldn't trust the science or the evidence that someone who's attacking the church gives you. I don't know if they're ignorant of the science or if they're deliberately hiding it. I'm not sure which is worse, to know that you're doing it wrong and do it or to be so ill-informed that you're willing to shoot your mouth off. But I guess we all do that on occasion. So the, the science here is complex and it takes an expert to guide you through it. Uh, and without that, you may feel kind of lost. And that's true a lot of things uh, about questions of the church. You may need someone with an expertise in history to, to guide you. You may need someone with an expertise in language. You may need something with an expertise in American culture in the 19th century. There's many things you may need help on. You can't always expect. really need to know. And you should go to people who've actually studied the issue and believe they have a response. If you listen to the critics, they're never going to tell you any of this. Uh, they've told you what they want you to hear or what they believe, and they're not going to help you solve the problem. And if you keep going to them, you're just going to spin round and round and get more and more convinced that they're right. You've got the blind leading the blind. Uh, but you need to go to someone like Hugo Perigo, someone who uh, has studied these things, uh, is one of the world experts, and yet he continuously says there's nothing in genetic science that calls into question the Book of Mormon. And from everything I've read and learned about genetics, I think he's absolutely right. I, I think it would be extraordinary. Uh, which brings up another lesson. There are some people in the church who try to use genetic evidence to support the Book of Mormon. That doesn't work either. Those efforts are all deeply, deeply flawed, and you shouldn't trust them either. They don't know what they're doing there. Uh, this is just an area that science is not going to help you. Uh, it can't answer the question we have because you're dealing with such small people uh, in such a big group. Uh, but lastly, it teaches you that the Book of Mormon can take anything you throw at it. This might look like a really ironclad argument, but the deeper you probe the Book of Mormon, the deeper you look at it, the more that's there. Uh, again, the fact that you can find these others there that Joseph Smith has in there, that's in the translation, it's there, it's always been there, but nobody noticed. That is extraordinary. I mean, A, it's extraordinary that it's there to find and that we can tease it out. Uh, most books that are forgeries or things like that look less and less convincing the longer you have them. The Book of Mormon has done the opposite. It becomes more and more convincing. More and more things show up, which is really amazing in and of itself. But even more importantly, I think, Joseph Smith and those he uh, taught did not seem to figure it out. Uh, so if you believe Joseph is faking all this, you have to have him clever enough to solve all these problems and then never call attention to them and just leave them there as little time bombs to blow up when we need them. That to my mind takes more faith than believing an angel brought him some plates and God helped him translate them. The Book of Mormon is true and DNA and all the science that you can throw at it will not change that. I leave you that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.